For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Welcome to another Philosophical Conversation. My name is Cadell Last, and I'm here today with Matthew Stanley, who is the creator of Samsara Diagnostics, a place for finding freedom in finitude through dialogue with theology, philosophy, and psychoanalysis. His work aims to support religious and philosophical practice through writing, research, and reflection on Samsara Diagnostics. And you can find a link to that website and his work below. Here today, we're going to discuss one of the articles that he published through Samsara Diagnostics called It Was Nothing, Heidegger and Nishitani on Anxiety and Nothingness, a text, like I said, which Matthew published through Samsara Diagnostics, and we'll get into all of the nuances of what that title might point towards. But first, Matthew, just welcome and maybe... For those who haven't uh, read your work or encountered Samsara Diagnostic yet, why don't you just introduce yourself and some of the stuff you're up to uh, at Samsara? Thanks, Cadell. I'm really excited to be here. I really appreciate the invite and the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm Matthew, and like Cadell said, I write at Samsara Diagnostics. I also podcast at Samsara Audio. Um, how trying to have conversations about religion, philosophy, and psychoanalysis operating at that intersection. I grew up studying theology. That was kind of my core thing that I did as a young man. I was in kind of a micro Protestant denomination growing up um, in a slightly larger denomination now, but um, spent a lot of time kind of cutting my teeth. I read a post about this, cutting my teeth on Calvinism and the, that debate with uh, within Protestantism. And then I went off to college, thought I was going to study that, but ended up really enjoying hanging out with philosophy majors a little bit better. Um, a little bit more open-minded, more interesting questions that kind of opened me up to new conversations that I really enjoyed. So um, these days I have a family. I work a full-time job. I'm not in academia at all. Um, like we were talking about, I basically keep academia at arm's length and engage on my terms because I'm not really willing to give up my life and my family's stability uh, to the gods of the academy, you know, and what they would demand and and that sort of thing. So uh, but I continue to write. So Samsara Diagnostics is where I I write books and I write posts. Right now it's a weekly post. Um, and that's been the outlet where I'm working through the ideas that I find most interesting. And I use it as a way to connect with other people like yourself um, and other people I've met through the Philosophy Portal community, uh, through writing, through working on ideas together. And that's kind of my little corner of the internet. Fantastic. Yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure to to read Samsara Diagnostics, and I really like some of the stuff you're doing there. And actually, the first the first major work that I, I read of yours was was downloading. It was it was nothing, which I saw when I when I downloaded it was originally published published in in 2017, and then and then or originally worked on in 2017, and then and then published officially again maybe uh, through Samsara in in 2023. So. When I first saw that, I was just sort of originally interested in sort of the whole process that's been going on with this work, you know, its origin being several years ago, you know, where was your mind uh, when this sort of project started to unfold um, and sort of uh, where are you now with it in, in 2023? Yeah, this um, this paper, it was nothing. It originally began as the kind of final paper for a seminar I was doing in my senior year on phenomenology. So I had a semester long seminar. We'd read Husserl and we'd read Heidegger. We'd read some of the other phenomenologists. And uh, at that time I was really into Japanese culture, Japanese philosophy, and I was trying to find ways to bring that into pretty much everything that I was doing. So I would basically use my classes as a way to investigate what I was interested in instead of what the class wanted me to study. And I enjoyed phenomenology. But over the summer, I had found in like a little, in a little bookshop in Seattle, I'd found a book called Religion and Nothingness by um, Nishitani Keiji. And I'd never heard of him before, but I was like, well, this looks fascinating. So I picked it up, um, spent the whole summer reading it. And uh, 
I saw the connection with Heidegger. I knew I looked into it more. I realized that Nishitani was a part of kind of a group of Japanese philosophers who had some contact with German philosophy and that Nishitani even studied in Germany with Heidegger for a couple of years. So there was, there was this East West dialogue going on that I'd never been aware of. And so I decided to write my paper on that. Um, I ended up writing that paper and when I, I was in the philosophy department one day and there was a poster with a call for papers for the um, Boston College Undergraduate Philosophy Journal. And it was calling, it was a call for papers. And I was like, well, I've got a paper. I'm gonna just gonna send it into them. And uh, a couple months later, they reached out and said, hey, we'd like to publish your paper. So I ended up publishing that piece with the Boston College uh, Journal of Philosophy, Dianoia. And so that was, that felt really gratifying. I was like, wow, it actually, and it fit really well because they were trying to do kind of world philosophies for that, um, for that edition. So it really fit in with alongside, alongside some Hindu philosophy, so Islam, Islamic philosophy. So it was really a cool uh, collection that they pulled together. And I felt like mine uh, played a good part in that. So that was gratifying. And uh, it's been a few years since I've touched that paper, but this year in 2023, Back in January, I decided to just go all in. I'm going to post every single week. I'm just going to make myself do that. I'm going to set that for myself and see what comes out of it. I started this whole experiment of writing every week, working on a book, trying to connect with people on the internet, actually, and just following my own nose about what I wanted to work on. And I, one thing that I heard was, hey, you should put a free artifact out there, a lead magnet. And so I decided, hey, I've got this piece. It's been published before. I'll kind of could it, I'll put it into some cool design um, on Canva and I'll share it with folks because I think that people might be interested in it. And so I put it out there and I've got I got I would say most of my signups through the past of through the past year, at least the first half of the year, were through uh, just offering that piece for free to folks. And in fact, some people even paid me for it as a tip, and that was extremely gratifying. I didn't even expect that to happen. So um, there's been a positive response to it and. To me, I see it very much as um, it does kind of set a guiding light for some of my interests that I've been working on for the past five years, I would say. Fantastic. I think that guiding light is, is, is in terms of how I sort of um, interpreted your text as a whole is is a very important one, again, at that intersection of, of East and West and um, uh, of, of philosophy and religion. Um, and 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 all of those things in the context of being thrown, I guess, to use the Heideggerian term, into a into a global world, um, in, into a type of global village, and and as a consequence of that, you know, all of our traditions, all of our thought schools, sort of getting thrown into a, a certain type of, let's say, uh, anxiety about about their identity and their relations uh, relationships to each other. Um, so like in that, in that, in that vein, like let's, let's maybe slowly introduce to people who haven't read the work and, and it'll be, it'll be linked in the description, but to those who haven't read the work, you know, what's going on there between Heidegger and the Kyoto, Kyoto, Kyoto school? Um, and maybe what do you think, uh, this dialogue between Heidegger and Nishitani, um, is, is, um, how relevant do you think this dialogue is for our contemporary circles? Do you see it coming up in contemporary philosophical and religious circles? And you know, just maybe an overview of what's going on there. There's a lot to say there. Um, I think that the way that the article kind of frames things initially is by talking about the idea of nothingness, which is at the core of Nishitani's philosophy, but is also extremely relevant to Heidegger's philosophy as well. Um, Nishitani is a Zen Buddhist, and so nothingness is at the heart of the way that he approaches philosophy, his religious practice, the way that he understands things. The goal for him is to understand the emptiness of all things, but even the emptiness of emptiness. And that's kind of what's interesting is this movement towards trying to empty nothingness a a nothing that is less than nothing in kind of the Zizekian sense but i don't think he's going there he's because he doesn't have the psychoanalytic background he doesn't have these same concepts but i do think that there's there's a dialogue there of this attempt to empty emptiness 
Um, and so the reason I call it, it was nothing was because I started with a quote from Heidegger where he talks about anxiety that is where he's basically talking about how anxiety is the most it's the most authentic mode of attunement for Dasein because it it really does indicate uh, Dasein's nature in that when you're done being anxious, you go, oh, actually, it was nothing. And then you say more than you mean when you say, oh, it was nothing. Uh, because Heider is trying to point out it was indeed nothing, but it was nothing that you were anxious about. And so that conversation, how can you be anxious about a nothing? about nothing, about a nothing. Um, Nishitani is interested in that question too, because for him, he wants to get at the Western philosophers who he thinks are still reifying nothingness. Like for him, the fact that you could be anxious about nothing means that nothing is still an object to you, that there's still something external about it, unmediated, you could say about it, that it doesn't, it still feels like it's not really you. And so he wants to point out that, you know, he's going to point out that guys like Descartes and he kind of goes through this, maybe you're going to get to this, but he kind of goes through the stages of, he talks about Descartes and then he talks about Sartre and then he talks about Heidegger and he tries to kind of move past all three of them and proposes kind of this Zen philosophy of Shinyata or absolute nothingness as a better philosophical formulation than what the West has on offer. Yeah, it's it's um it's interesting to sort of think about um the dialogue there between between Heidegger and Nishitani, specifically on on the concept of 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 nothing. Um what do you think what do you think's go what do you think's attracting Nishitani to Heidegger in the first place? Why do you think Nishitani is visiting Heidegger um, as opposed to the other way around. What 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 is it that Nishitani is sensing in the Western tradition? Does he sense that there's a lack in Zen that he's looking for in the Western tradition, or is he what what's motivating him there? Do you know? So that's pretty complicated, but I can speak to more of the kind of cultural political line on things because what's happening here at least historically in japan is that they're coming out of the meiji era in japan where japan is basically trying to catch up with the rest of the world they spent 200 250 years completely closed off from the rest of the world um matthew perry shows up in their harbors with gunboats and is like hey you guys got to open up we're all we're all out here waiting for you um and so they they do that and what they do is they basically have to catch up those couple centuries in terms of development within 50 years so what they do is you know they send they send their young men around the world study all of the world philosophies study their political systems study their science bring it all back home and they reverse engineer it rework it and they brought themselves basically up to a world power within 50 60 70 years um <laughs> my light just went out there we go um <laughs> and um so what's ha what's happening is like nishitani's teacher nishida is older and he's kind of coming out of this trend and so he was studying western philosophy in during this period of trying to catch up and trying to understand what was out there and basically trying to sift the best of the best from all the other cultures. And uh, what happened was Germ was Japan really ended up landing on Germany or the Prussian empire. And then Germany as kind of their favorite, they preferred their governance structures. They preferred their science. They had a temperamental harmony with each other. And so what happened was they started to import German philosophy as well to read it and try to understand what was going on there. So, Initially, the the way that that philosophy got into the country was because of that uh, consonance between their political way of doing things and wanting to basically import the German system. So, but then what happened was these Zen practitioners, Nishida, Tanabe, Nishitani, they were wrestling with the 
with Kant and with Hegel and with Husserl, with Descartes, Bergson. They're reading all these guys and they're struggling and they're realizing that there are some similar insights here where after the transcendental turn with Kant, the West is starting to understand the emptiness of phenomena. They're starting to grapple with the fact that consciousness is always bringing itself to the table and that consciousness is always implicated in whatever it's doing, whatever it's thinking, whatever it's knowing. And so they're trying to understand how is the West wrestling with this problem? And they're also using it to think about the, that same problem from a different perspective than Zen can offer. And what they ultimately are trying to do, though, is they are Zen practitioners. So they think that Zen has something unique to bring to the table. And so at times there's there's sections that feel kind of apologetic where they're trying to kind of push Zen as, as better. But oh, in my personal opinion, they're, they're really curious. They're really just brilliant uh, thinkers who are genuinely struggling and they want to find the connections. They want to see the overlaps. They want to understand how the West can help them see things a little differently. You know, it's interesting. There's, <clears throat> there's some, uh, memes I like about the relationship between French and German philosophy, where they show a, a two students taking a test and the, the German student is, is hard at work on his test. And then the French student is looking over and copying the German uh, test. And this is just giving the relationship between like, say, uh, I don't know, like a Lacan and a Hegel or like uh, I don't know a a Deleuze and a and a Nietzsche, like <laughs> like the where the the French are just uh copying and sort of maybe we could make another maybe we could make another meme here with the with the Japanese, but it's it, it's interesting here to see, you know, it makes sense historically speaking that that there's some sort of cultural connection here with the Germans and and the Japanese. Of course, they became allies during during uh, World War Two as well. Um, and what what's coming to my mind is is the, the 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 what you're communicating here the way in which Japan um, sent out it, its young men to um, learn from from Western tradition, Western philosophy, Western science, Western politics. You know that in some sense we've grown up at a time I feel in the 21st century where. A lot of people, and maybe since the 1960s, to be honest, maybe since the cultural cultural revolution in the 1960s, that a lot of people in the West have have gone to the East and and taken sort of traditions, have brought Buddhism back here. So there there's there's a way in which there is this sort of cross fertilization, as it were, between the East and West generally in this in this transition. And it might be getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but you you note towards the end of the paper that. You know, in this decline of Western hegemony, as what you know, clearly Western culture as 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 a global force towards a new global world, that we should see this as an opportunity to a new transition. Um, is what do you think this relationship is between um, this cross fertilization between Eastern ideas and Western ideas, Western ideas and Eastern ideas, in in the bigger picture? What do you think is going on here? I think the thing that we have to distinguish and that is the real challenge to figure out is to what extent are we in the West engaging with Eastern ideas and to what extent are we engaging with capitalized, Easternicized memes? And that to me is kind of one of the big struggles because I actually think when you get inside, when you get inside uh, East Asian culture, when you get inside Japanese culture, and I have to keep kind of like narrowing down because even this idea of an Asia is just not even historically it makes no sense. It's a total monster. And so like if you get inside Japanese culture, like as a Westerner, you feel like this doesn't make any sense. It's so weird to me. And, and so the reality is that what we've kind of received here in the West are the attempts of folks like, DT Suzuki trying to popularize ideas out of their context into a new context in a way that's kind of memeable. You know, you get guys like Alan Watts. Um, you've you you also get like 
white people going to India and studying with a yogi and coming back and having this kind of like weird amalgam of, and they don't know any of the traditions. They don't know the, like the structure of where these ideas came from. Like uh, there's this, it's dehistoricized, it's memeable, it's commodifiable, it's oftentimes filed down, it's kind of flat. And I think that for me, I'm really, I'm really interested in what is truly unique about, I mean, specifically Japanese culture, but East Asian culture, and then kind of more broadly, I think that if you kind of think about it as like the Budo sphere would be kind of a way to put it, basically, wherever Buddhism has historically spread, that would be kind of what I would consider to be, there is there is this kind of underlying religious culture. Now, it's not the same as Christianity, the way that Christianity spread, because Christianity when it spread, it brought not just a religion, but it also brought a politics with it. The thing is that Buddhism, Buddhism didn't bring a politics with it. When Buddhism spread, it was this purely, it was purely religious. It was typically cloistered monastic life. It was asceticism. It was temple life. It didn't really touch the political sphere. And so what happened was typically you needed some sort of a political supplement. So it goes to China and there's this Buddhist religion and then what happens is Confucianism kind of steps in to tell you how should you run your government? What does your relationship with your father and mother look like? How do you treat other people? Because Buddhism does, doesn't does answer these questions for you. So Confucianism has to step in and do that. So that's kind of what happened in East Asia specifically. But I would say that we could speak about kind of like a Buddha sphere of emanating from India in you know and then out into tibet and southeast asia then into china then korea japan uh that i would kind of there is this underlying thread of kind of the disparate buddhist traditions but all kind of tracing back to that historical origin in india yeah it's it's a super interesting distinction you're bringing up there in regards to the buddha sphere having a sort of underlying religious culture leading to monastic life but not having any sort of connection or any politics related to governance or family or everyday everyday life um and of course this is something that that is maybe more of a, a feature of like you mentioned confucianism maybe we could also mention hinduism and also of course the western tradition uh, islam uh, christianity christianity judaism what do you think's going on there do you think that this is a a fundamental weakness in Buddhism? Is it a feature of Buddhism? Is it is it, is it the strength of Buddhism? What's this? Why this apolitical stance? And and what what's your sense of of what's going on uh, in this uh, apolitical stance? Well, I've been trying to talk to a lot of Buddhists about this, and I really seem to get kind of like a lot of different answers about it. And I'm not a practicing Buddhist, so. You know, there's a sense in which I'm kind of an anthropologist trying to understand the tradition, trying to understand the ways of thought. Um, I can, in some sense, I can see it with more objectivity because I'm not a part of it. But in other ways, there are things about it that are inaccessible to me because I'm not a practitioner. So um, you have, on the one hand, you have socially engaged Buddhists, often in the Jodo Shinshu tradition. And they see, for instance, social justice as a core part of their religious practice, um, that be activism, protest, political organization. And then you also have on the totally other wing, you've got, uh, there's Zen Buddhists who just are completely affirmative of whatever the power structure is. There was a video going around on Twitter the other week of an Israeli Zen teacher who, um, it sounds like maybe the translation was bad and perhaps what he said wasn't quite as bad as it sounds, but the reality is that he was offering advice to young Israeli soldiers on how to not kind of not feel so bad about killing people, you know, and like that ha same thing happened in, in, in Japanese Zen during the world, world war two. So you have these totally different sides, totally regime affirming, um, totally sort of leftist activist and you've got all kinds of things in the middle because there is an emphasis in buddhism on uh, the uh, compassion for all beings uh, but how that looks is never really kind of implemented in terms of law there's not this law about how to love others it's more like cultivating being the type of person who will love people 
And then there's kind of not a lot of guidance about what that's going to look like. There's a lot of rules about monastic living, about cleanliness, about asceticism. And like, there's a lot of rules about practice because the emphasis is on the formation that takes place through practice. And then it's kind of like the goal of practice is to kind of release you back into the world to be able to be the type of person that, um, you know, that you've been formed to be, which is hopefully in line with uh, the compassion of, and benevolence of the Buddha and that sort of thing. So uh, the, we also, you also in Buddhism, you have this figure of the Bodhisattva who turns away from enlightenment in order to uh, seek enlightenment for all beings. So basically a, a, a Buddha who says, I actually refuse to attain enlightenment until all other creatures attain enlightenment with me. And then the, the, the Bodhisattva works towards the enlightenment of other beings. And so there's this sacrificial kind of ethical stance of the Bodhisattva that seeks the good of others above their own that is also present in the tradition. So, you know, but to what extent is the Bodhisattva still clinging to uh, life or clinging to some conception of other versus me. Um, at the same time, you can make an argument that the Bodhisattva is an even more uh, intelligent approach to dependent origination, where if I'm dependent on you and you're dependent on me, there's actually no way I could attain enlightenment without you also being enlightened. You know, so there's, to me, I, I don't think there's any one definitive interpretation of how to approach these things. I'm I'm kind of learning in all the different ways of seeing it. Speaking from a Christian perspective, I I do think that there is I, – I like the emphasis on practice that Buddhism has. I am concerned about the fact that it isn't – that that love is not mobilized in terms of law. Um, so that's a concern for me, and one reason that I kind of prefer Christianity is the way that love is kind of turned into this law and the way that it – we have to grapple with law um, and that that isn't so much operative in Buddhism. So um, I said a lot there, but there's, there's a lot of wrestling going on with, with these various perspectives. Yeah. I mean, I actually did spend some time at a, at a Buddhist um, monastery um, a few years ago, maybe even five years ago now. And I remember going to, one of their training sessions where they were it's like a potential initiation into becoming a, a part of monastic life. And there were just these tons of rules, like tons of rules. Like, and, and, the, and the rules were different for men and women. So there was like a distinction, sexual difference. But ultimately, these rules were designed to basically keep you within monastic life until the end. Um, and so it, it and and this community was sort of isolated from, let's say, mainline or mainstream society. Um, so it's it's just interesting to think about this distinction between a form of religious practice, which of course emerges in many religious traditions of that are basically forms of, I would say, withdrawal from the world versus religious traditions that try to maintain themselves in the world. And and I think it's it's a nice sort of note here that there's some relationship there between love and law that needs to be grappled with um, in order to maintain some sort of capacity to love within the world. Um, at least world here being mainstream society. And maybe that will give us a, a connection here to Heidegger's concept of Dasein as being in the world. There's some things I want to ask you about Dasein, but the first thing I want to ask you about Dasein, because you brought up the Christian perspective just now, is I've been constantly playing with and wrestling with the notion of Dasein being in the world, whereas Christianity always says you, have, you want to be in the world, but not of the world, or we are in the world, but not of the world. And I wonder if you've sort of played around with this distinction in your own reading of Heidegger and, and Christianity. Yeah, part of the difficulty that goes on is that scripture as a literary work 
uses words in different ways at different times. And so part of the, like, the problem is that we see that on the one hand, scripture says that God made the world and that he said it was very good. And then Jesus says, be in the world, but not of the world. What's going on, you know? And so part of the thing that has to be worked through is what does the world mean in these contexts and and how is it being used? So Heidegger kind of does something similar because on the one hand, he's going to say uh, Dasein is being in the world. But on the other hand, he's also saying that you can get absorbed in the crowd or the Das Mann, you know, so like you can get caught up in the chatter. You know, and that might be another way of talking about the world. For instance, what is the world? Society is just the circulation of chatter and of memes and of identities and of ways of getting captured. So you could use world in that way. And I think that there's a sense in which scripture is using wor world as the powers that be, as the, the forces and the ideas and the people and the authorities that structure the way that that the world operates. and But I do think that there's a distinction there between uh, that and kind of existence itself and of um, engaging sincerely with what does exist and with other creatures and with the way that things, there is a way that things are scripture does seem to indicate and there's also another way that things are and there's kind of this war going on in the world between uh, principalities and powers is kind of the phrase that paul uses so i think parsing these apart is really difficult but like i pointed out i think heidegger kind of has a has a distinction that gets close to this as well um in the das sein versus the das Mann. so here if i'm sort of understanding you correctly when we say in the world but not of the world that could mean not being of the world is not being of dasman like we'd be in the world but not of the world of dasman is maybe if you is that distinction ma making sense yeah that could be one way of approaching it is kind of what i'm saying i think that being uh, not being subject to, you know, what is the ideology of the time? What is the fashion of the elite? What is the, um, I like Scott Alexander's image of Moloch. I don't know if you've read his, his piece on Moloch. Um, it's sort of, um, it's, it's fairly old. It's definitely over a decade old, but he talks about Moloch as this kind of cosmic spirit of, infinite optimization that would just eat everything and i think that there is this way in which there is there's a spirit to things um the, uh, where if you kind of like push something it would kind of like go to its limit where it would go to its extreme where it kind of wants to go where it would worship that sort of uh that sort of movement i think finding out what what is what is society worshiping what is the thing that people are organizing themselves around? What are they sacrificing themselves to? That to me is, you want to ask that question. And that's what Jesus is saying. Don't be about that. Whatever that thing is, it's it probably wants to kill you. Like it's bad. It's uh, it, there's There are spirits and powers in this world that are way beyond you. You know, and you can, you can, you can spiritualize that. You can despiritualize that. I think there are lots of different ways to take it, but even in like kind of a purely materialist sense, I really think that there's a strong argument to be made that there are these principalities and powers that are at work. I mean, Nick Land is kind of theorizing these, like if you look at Nick Land's theorizing about the outside, um, about AI as a force of assembling itself from the future, th these are fascinating things to think about because this is sort of like a purely materialist principality and power. Um digital cybernetic molek that's coming from the future to to eat us all alive. I think it's fascinating to to think about these possibilities and that Jesus Jesus got eaten by the by the molek of his time. I mean, you look at the spirit of the Roman Empire, it's just this massive altar to ego, to the ever expanding greedy belly of more money, more power, more bringing bringing more and more people under their rule. 
some Christian theologians call this the spirit of empire. I think that's a great way of looking at it. And so um, it is good to note that like Jesus wasn't crucified by the Roman empire because he, um, because they necessarily understood who he was. It, the, the narrative seems to be that Pilate didn't know who the hell this guy was and he just gave the Jews what they wanted. But the reality is that once the Christian church got going, the Roman empire realized, oh shoot, these guys are a major problem. And that's why they persecuted them so heavily um, because they refused to bow down to the gods that were, uh, that people obey, that obeying them kept these, kept people compliant. It kept them in the circulation of the way of the empire. Yeah. I love thinking about these things. I mean, even before we pressed recording, you know, we, we were talking about capitalism as this, you know, this, 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 like Moloch, like this monster, like this, thi like this, 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 this enormous monstrous force in the world. And, and, you know, I, I think that at least when I think about my experiences with the temptation to monastic life, I think a lot of my temptations to monastic life come from a desire to escape Moloch. Um, that I want, like, that there's a big part of me, a major part of me, because I'm still here, is that, <laughs> that I want to be, quote unquote, in the world in the sense of engaging with, you know, the world and human beings, the human species in its totality without creating a little monastic separation from it. And at the same time, what it seems to require is to engage engage with the fact that there is a Moloch in the world, that there is a monster in the world. I like the idea that, of a monstrous force. Um, and somehow we have to engage with it, but the ethics of engaging with it and how to engage with it and 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 how to draw the line and create our boundaries and 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 it's 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 a it it really does require perhaps you know the ethics of these spiritual teachings from a a buddha or a jesus or a nishatani or a heidegger and and that brings me to sort of the question that i wanted to ask you about about heidegger because and specifically design, because one of the concepts I love the most about Heidegger and design is this idea of thrownness, this idea that we are thrown into the world. And one of the things that I like the most about this concept is that our, our being thrown into the world is not our choice. <clears throat> I think this is a lovely, I think that resonates so strongly with and 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 perhaps is the utmost strangeness of our existence is you know it's it's actually the exact inverse of a video game you know you 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 know when you play a bit like you play a mario play mario like mario kart you know you play mario kart you know you pick your character uh and you pick the stage you want to go in in some sense when you're playing a video game you're throwing the character uh into the world <laughs> But it's kind of the opposite for our actual existence, right? So how do you relate to this idea of Dasein thrownness? And perhaps also, if you can, relate it to Nishitani and Buddhism and, and how does how is there a, a discourse here? Yeah, there's so much there because this idea of thrownness has really been something that I've been wrestling with as I've been trying to understand... Um, how do we live as finite creatures? I, I, part of my project at its core is how do we view finitude as kind of the positive conditions of freedom rather than as a prison to be escaped? Because I think that this is the temptation, um, not only of religions, but even uh, kind of modern progressive eschatologies like transhumanism. The goal is to escape the body to escape death it's to eliminate suffering it's these um it's these these eschatologies of total salvation and fulfillment and to me i 
I want to figure out how we can live differently and engage with our finitude in a way that is loving, that's graceful, and that I think is more modeled by God, because God took finitude upon himself and, in fact, carries finitude in his own body. I like to point out that uh, at the end of the book of Revelation, we see the lamb who was slain who's reigning on the throne, but he still has the wound in his side. And so even God, who is king, is still the wounded king. He retains his wounds and they're part of his glory. And so to me, how do we how do we kind of re-envision our life as finite creatures, as like the glory of a wound and figuring out how can we kind of live into that and figure that out? And I think that... That's what a lot of people like about Heidegger. I think they're really drawn to Heidegger. He's kind of, when you're a young philosophy student and you pick up Heidegger, you're like, whoa, he like blows your mind. He's a total, uh, he's a total red pill to get into philosophy. Uh, I think you kind of need to move past him. I think he does end up being a dead end in, in the long run. But I think that to get you into philosophy, it, you see this guy who's really struggling to engage with the fact that death and nothingness and limitations are the core of what we are and how we grapple with them. And yet there's this aspect of freedom to where we're engaging with them and all the things that are trying to tie us down and how knowledge is kind of always in the cyclical movement of understanding. It's always incomplete. It, it really kind of gets you going and excited to want to learn more about the world and engage more with your own being and with the being of others, because you realize that it's not just um, it's not just an artifact to be an earth or an answer to be arrived at through a formula, but it's actually this ongoing adventure that you get to go on. And so I think that Heidegger has this air of adventure about his work that people really seem to resonate with. And I love that image of adventure. I want to see, I want to see us think about our own thrownness more through like, well, video game, you're thrown into the game. It, it's it's a game. There's an adventure that we get to go on, but we don't get to go on any adventure. We get to go on the one that we've been given. Um, now, Nietzsche, I think, is the supplement here because at the same time, he's going to say, like, you've been thrown, love your thrownness, like love the fate that you've been thrown into. Well, at the same time, he's also going to say that you are actively creating that fate, you know, that you're a part of. And so... I think that um, understanding that you can't really change your fate unless you love your fate is this spirit of adventure that I think we need as finite beings. Yeah, I love that. <clears throat> and I think it's, it's for the imaginary, I think it's, it's hard sometimes for people to make that reversal that you just emphasized, which is that, you know, you you get to go on an adventure, but it's the adventure you've been given. It's in so and so there there's there's this there's this way I think sometimes maybe it's the ego. Maybe the ego struggles to accept the adventure they've been given. Um, and the ego wants to pause it, it's it's its own adventure. Um and I'm just wondering here because Sometimes when I was uh, involved with with men's work, um, part of the men's work involved sort of the trouble a lot of men have with um, affirming their adventure in the world as opposed to getting stuck into the video games or something like that or getting stuck down whatever it is, online portals or online holes that they get sucked down. And so there's this there's this sense in which it's 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 a huge struggle for people to pr precisely accept the adventure of, I would say, adult life, you know, and 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 aff and aff affirming that event, seeing that as positive, you know, and, and there's a number of different avenues I could point to here in my own life and sort of friends or or family members that seems to me when you hit a certain age, usually in your late teenage years you come to sort of a realization of how dark adult life is and you have a sort of difficulty affirming that adventure as as positive or maybe you come to confront some sort of anxiety about what adult life is 
um, and and as you brought up in your paper, sort of recoil from it, run away from it. Um, so maybe this is a good opening to go into how does Heidegger talk about Dasein and the experience of anxiety as sort of a key to understanding nothingness? Um, and maybe how does that relate to our capacity to affirm this adventure? Yeah, I before I address that, I kind of wanted to say that I, I'm a bit of a double mind about what you just said, where... On the one hand, I agree with you that I think there needs to be, when young people arrive at a certain point, they need to transition out of being a child into being an adult. And that involves affirming the adventure of finitude. But I don't want to downplay the fact that I think that the deal that our society does give us is objectively getting shittier. You know, and so I do want to like affirm that that anxiety does have a basis in hey, maybe what I'm being given actually isn't that great, you know? And so like there's, I see more and more people wanting to reject that deal. And I feel very torn about that because on the one hand, one hand, I want people to engage with society, create good things, build bonds of mutual support. I want people to start families. I want there to be more children. I want there to be people who love each other unto death. And at the same time, when people opt out of that, when I see the objective reality of how the dating game works, of what work life is like, of how our politics are structured, of how expensive and difficult it is to raise children in our age, I, I feel like I blame people less and less for wanting to opt out of that game. And so I think to me, I feel very torn about, about that, of like maybe that anxiety about not wanting to accept the deal is indicative of something about the deal. You know, most boomers and parents are just like, suck it up. That's just how life is. But that ignores the fact that like we wake up and create a world together every single day. Like it, it's this distinction between, you know, that we mentioned between Das Sein and Das Man. Like there is an extent where a lot of those things are Das Man and are therefore changeable. And we know this because historically these sort of structures are always constantly changing and in flux. Different societies at different times have them in different ways. So anyways, I wanted to point that out because I think that that's important to note. I, I want to ma remain sensitive to that kind of like canary in the coal mine. I think it's a super important point. I'm totally with you. So to kind of talk about Heidegger and nothingness, I think that the, the first thing that is important about Heidegger and why I think that he is, he does resonate with Zen is that he's trying to incorporate nothingness into what we are that, you know, while Zen does accuse the West of like, especially he accuses, uh, Nishitani accuses Sartre specifically of kind of reifying nothingness as this kind of springboard that we continually project ourselves off of. I do think Heidegger is trying to make nothingness and, um, incompleteness perhaps as a as a part of what we are um it's it's essential and constitutive of what the da sign is that it is never fully itself that it never that it's always leaving it never arrives and this is why uh, there's this whole sort of academic field looking at heidegger and dogen who was a 12th century Zen Buddhist, who he was really, he's probably the most foundational Japanese Zen thinker. Um, he's written, he, he wrote a lot, but he wrote a little piece called Time Being, Uji. And that little piece, I, I write about it in a book that I'm working on. And it's, it, it, I would recommend checking it out, read it for like a brain puzzle, compare it to Heidegger, and Dogen is talking about the same thing of like, you are still confused because you think time is something other than you, you know, you are time. And he wants to, he wants you to incorporate these things that seem like external limitations and objects. He wants you to realize that they are you and that you are them. And so there's this essential interdependence and mutual determination that's taking place. 
And Heidegger captures that a lot, I think, with Dasein about its being there, but it's also having death as the possibility of all possibilities. Um, that there's this there's this ground that we have, but this ground is not a ground at all. It's actually just an abyss. And so again, Zen is trying to play with this, but Zen wants us to even move past this idea of the abyss as a thing or as something that's separate from us. The um, Nishitani wants us to see how uh, everything, everything is itself by not being itself. For instance, that's one way that he would put it. Or everything is itself by e being in the home ground of everything else and that we are present with every other thing in its home ground are some phrases that he uses to try to explain this. So to recap, I think it's Heidegger's interesting and resonates with Zen for the way that he's trying to incorporate nothingness into who we are and make it constitutive of us rather than as something external to us that we should be anxious about, for instance. Well, I think it's, I mean, I've been trying to hold something in, in my mind for some time since, since reading your piece and, and even throughout this conversation is, you know, specifically this point about Nishitani feeling like Western philosophers reified nothing. Um, and, and here pointing to Sartre, um, but also like you mentioned already, pointing towards other Western philosophers. And when it comes to the way he's trying to communicate the lack of separateness between us and nothing, um, like you said so well, um, everything is itself by not being itself. I wonder if they read Hegel's logic because like the ground of Hegel's logic is being and nothing is the same thing. And then you get becoming or you get process. So there's this idea that, that I think Hegel's logic precisely avoids turning nothing into an object, avoids reifying nothingness and rather goes to the unity of being and nothing being process or something like that, which seems to me to be something like what Nishitani is pointing towards in the end with sort of coming to this idea of of process in the end of the debt we're not substance we're 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 process um maybe get your feedback on that first and and see if there's a point of connection there and and if you've thought along similar lines so my understanding is that they they have read hegel but i don't know enough about their particular interpretation of Hegel. I've actually been thinking about that as a one of my next lines of research is to kind of ransack Nishida's work to try to find all of his references to Hegel to see what does he actually say? Because I do know that he read Hegel, but I don't know enough about their interpretation. Uh, my hunch is simply that they would have viewed Hegel as kind of arriving at this achieved sort of full knowledge that they're going to want to undermine. Um, and so what that probably is, is, you know, it's a misunderstanding. It's either a misunderstanding of Hegel or it's just missing a different interpretation of Hegel. You know, what, whatever Hegel meant is sort of pointless uh, to try to argue about, but uh, to, you know, like, because we can't be in his brain, but the, if you can read Hegel a certain way, that's fruitful, you know, maybe they missed that interpretation. And so, um, certainly they never read Zizek, so they, they never had that chance, but, um, that is one line of research that I've been thinking about is trying to see how can we read Zen and Hegel together? Because on, on the face of it, they appear very different. I think that Hegel is sort of portrayed as kind of the ultimate philosopher of arrogance who wants to arrive at absolute knowledge and, and wholeness and who wants to sort of reconcile all things together and Zen is very much like um, trying to release you from all sort of conceptual work back into the things themselves. And I talk about this with Quinn on my most recent podcast. You can uh, it just came out yesterday. You can, I recommend you listen to this. But one thing that Quinn points out on that podcast is 
where there does seem to be a a disagreement between them is on the status of contradiction of to me i do interpret zen as saying that contradiction both is and is not real basically like contradiction is something that has to be superseded it's not ultimately real that there is a contradiction um between the things because there are no things that could be contradictory everything is dependently co-arisen um and so uh, an emptied emptiness is really just a way of getting beyond uh, the illusion the illusion of phenomena so whereas i think that hegel really does want to posit the existence of contradiction that contradiction can actually exist that we can actually posit it and that we can actually push it to its limit and without even needing to resolve contradiction so um there i think i think that's a really fruitful line of inquiry is understanding what is the status of contradiction in these two systems and are they really opposed because from my view they do seem to be opposed well i was just going to say on on the point of zen wanting you to release you sorry i wanted to say on the point of zen wanting to release you from all conceptual work back to the thing in themselves that's definitely against that's definitely opposed to what hegel's doing because because Hegel is about conceptual work and conceptual work and the mediation of the concept being the thing in itself as contradiction. So, th but at the same time, this distinction between Zen and Hegel, I think should be explored and, and we should bring out these contradictions and we should work with them. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's, 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 I, I maybe want to stay a little bit also on, on what you were saying, which I think is mega important, which is, um, that there is um, something extraordinarily valuable, not just about, for example, uh, men stop uh, stop going to the video games or whatever, withdrawing from the world and, and go into the world. No, we should actually say that there's a truth here to the recoil from the world that we're getting a bad deal. Um, and, and that, like, to me, I always bring up politically, I feel, I don't know what you think, I always feel like, we need a new social contract. I feel like we've reached a point where the social contract of our society has ha has broken down. Um, but I want to connect this back to um, this encounter with anxiety, this encounter with nothingness, and how you describe Heidegger's design as initially fleeing or fearing this nothingness fleeing or fearing this anxiety so the distinction i want to make here is irrespective of the legitimacy of the encounter with our society the anxiety with our society there's a f fair deal or an unfair fair deal that there's an initial encounter with a wanting to flee it uh, a fear of it um and and what are the stakes here of our response um to encountering anxiety and 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 in some sense, it brings up to me, you know, political, political, imminent political necessity. So I think that Lacan is the necessary supplement here because Heidegger's saying anxiety comes about when we encounter nothingness, or at least it indicates the presence of nothingness. But I think Lacan takes a step further and says, yes, but it indicates the presence of a very particular nothingness, which is the presence of the other's desire. So Heidegger's not getting that specific. He's he's just kind of describing this general experience of feeling our own contingency. However, I think that Lacan locates that particular experience in an encounter with the other, in understanding that the the other's desire is proximate is proximate to me, and that's what creates this whole um, this whole cascading experience of anxiety. And so, I think that uh, the stakes here are inextricably social, like you've pointed out, because it involves an encounter with the other. So. Um, yeah, I I think that the anxiety that we're feeling is related to our inability to relate to others and our grappling with, it's kind of the hysterical question of what am I to you? Why am I that? I think we're, a lot of us are struggling with that in a society that is so large, it's so machinic, 
it's so um, complex. Th there's this continual fracturing into kind of micro niches. I was just talking with my wife the other day of like, she wants to make friends, but she kind of has such a patchwork of um, ideas and ways she sees the world that she's sort of developed from engaging with ideas that she's learned on the internet that she has a hard time relating to other people, you know, like you kind of develop such a niche way of viewing the world that at a certain point, you're just like, what do I even talk about the real people in my life with? And so there's this continual fragmentation that's taking place where we don't know what we are to each other. And we're not sure why it's worth the time and the sacrifice to actually be in relationship with other people because it's risky, because it's painful, because it's dangerous. Um, it's time consuming. And it totally obliterates all our fantasies about what we thought our life would be like. So uh, the, the the reality is that as the digital world has delivered more and more fantasy to us, it has outstripped our desire to engage with reality, which is necessarily painful, defined by friction and by this uh, mediation process of having to push ourselves through the the meat grinder to see what kind of comes out on the other sides. So that's, those are, that's kind of a lot of thoughts, but I just, you, you probably have some thoughts too about that. Well, I just, I, I can, I can relate to your wife and uh, I, I, and, and my, my partner can relate to your wife as well. So you know, it's almost it's almost like, you know, what I'm coming to. And this is actually a point that you bring up from um, from uh, Nishitani um, is that the human being doesn't fit like there's this, this is not fitting quality um, of of the human being. And I, and I feel like in some sense, you know, there's this there's this T-shirt brand in Europe. I don't know if it's in North America as well, but it's called the the antisocial social club. And, and 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 I don't know where it comes from, but but there's just this idea that that you have maybe people who are identified with a certain horizon of Dasman, you have a recoil from Dasman, and then you have the problem of how do I find the others who don't fit? You know, and 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 I feel like the internet kind of brings like the problem is like then like the internet, you can meet some of these other people who don't fit. But then there's sort of, well, there's the problem of the disembodied nature of it all because, you know, we're all scattered around the whole planet. So it's like, <laughs> well, that, what good does that do us? You know, so, so there, there's this, but there's this loss of contact with, with just practical social reality. And there, there's a positive to that. And, and there, there, there's, there's a negative to that as well. But, you know, in regards to, um, this encounter with anxiety and sort of emphasizing Lacan as a supplement with the other's desire. Um, you know, you brought up the other with the Bodhisattva. Um, I think there's a lot of Christian theologians who would bring up the other as well. Um, the neighbor. Um, I'd be interested to know what do you think are the stakes of a conversation between Heidegger's notion of anxiety and Lacan's notion of anxiety as it regards to the other's desire? Does Heidegger get into this? Does he avoid this? Does he have an opposite view? You know, I think that's one criticism of Heidegger is that he tends to not be able to develop a coherent ethics of the other um there's you know, like the only real other in being in time it kind of turns out is the broken hammer or dasman like those are kind of like your options at least when it comes to um what are kind of the things that the dasign is trying to negotiate with like there's objects in your world and you start to think about them when they break down and there's the chatter of the crowd and there's death. And like, these are the things that you're grappling with, but there's not this, dis there's not a robust discussion of interpersonal relationship because people are not a crowd, even though like there is a sense in which our identities are of course determined by the big other, um, which is kind of this personification organizational principle of the crowd. 
Um, but that's just like a kind of a very unhelpful heuristic, but um, there's the crowd and there's the hammer, but human beings are not strictly speaking hammers in your world either, you know? So there's not really this object for another Dasein, you know, even animals in, in Heidegger's text are sort of this shadow of Dasein. They're sort of like impaired Dasein. So they can't even relate to Dasein as Dasein, um, which funny enough makes me think of uh, scripture where God says that, um, and uh, God did not find any other creature that was suitable to be a partner for Adam. So he had to create a partner, basically. Um, he creates another dos an another Dasein, but of course, a Dasein who's embodied in a different way. And so now there's this, uh, there's kind of this uh, interesting kind of contradiction between the two, uh, but they're connected as well. You know, her coming from his rib. So it, it, it's this really interesting story, but um Heidegger doesn't have this other Dasein to relate to who's this source of struggle and anxiety and who also has their own issues where they're grappling with death and Dasman and broken objects. That was really, really well said. And I really, well, I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, just in terms of we can think of others as tools Um we can uh, instrumentalize the world. Um, we can get caught up in in the chatter of the world. Say we get caught up in the in in identification with the big other or something, and 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 then we have our own personal relationship to death. But that still leaves the glaring hole of the other's desire and our desire as caught up in the other's desire. And, and how do we really work through that? How do we? Because it, it feels like you know when you know when you're talking about you know, the stakes of, for example, the the potential of a new social contract, if that is even a potential, is, you know, to have a world where we are having families and there are kids in the world and we do have relationships that are loving unto death and stuff like that. It seems to me like it would have to go beyond this triad of the broken hammer, the dosmon and the death to, 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 to really grappling with the other's desire, really. At the end of the end, like, you know, for example, to be able to think through the father, the mother, the child, right? And and the neighbor and, and, and all and all of these things. And I guess that would bring me to I mean, I think I've had conversations with David McCarricker of Theory Underground because he he has taught being in time and and um you know Dave is super generous and open with people being hyper critical of Heidegger. And usually where Dave comes to is like Heidegger's concepts are a good baseline for us to reinvent. Like we can reinvent Dasein. Like we can reinvent the way we think about Dasein. Like we could play around with, with bringing in concepts from Lacan, for example, or something like that. But the way I want to do that here is throw a question to you about the way you talk about Dasein as having no correlation with an object, that when when like that Dasein comes to its own most possibilities, um, and I like the way you described it as like um, Dasein has a a fraught relationship with the world, which maybe brings us to this distinction again between in the world but not of the world because we have a fraught relationship with the world, um, and and maybe the anxiety and where I want to ask this question is. Dasein's own most possibilities with taking into consideration the other's desire. Does that make sense? How do we think Dasein's own most possibilities while taking into consideration the other's desires? That's a difficult question. I think that as I consider what you're saying, I think about how there's always going to be, there's just always going to be some level of disappointment in the way that this is brokered. I personally believe, I think that there's like, there's not going to be any sort of full transparent communion with the other, for instance, there's never going to be like, I'll perfectly be seen for exactly what I am because the reality is that what you are is essentially incomplete and constantly under revision. And so I think that there is like, how do we work? How do we work that knowledge of 
whatever this kind of like fantastical fullness that we're that we're longing for how do we work kind of a deflation of expectations into into what we're doing and i think the way that we do that has to involve some sort of uh, it has to involve choosing and loving particular material circumstances and i think that that's i i worry about whether it's going to be possible in the future to really love your circumstances when you know about the possible existence of so many other circumstances. I, I, I personally believe that it was probably much easier to enjoy your finitude in, in ages past. Um, certainly there were other problems, uh, a lot more. Uh, I don't want to downplay those. I'm not some sort of Luddite. Uh, but I think that there is th there was probably a greater ability to engage with your finitude as something that was given or, or thrown into because you didn't have so much agency over shifting the kind of bars and beams of it as much. And to me, the fact that I could go on the internet and go on Google Maps, and I, I love to go on Google Maps, I can go explore other places and things like that. The fact that I can do that from my chair completely relativizes my own location the fact and and the fact that i could go and i could buy a plane ticket and fly there right now if i wanted to i could just do that i could just get up i could get up i could change jobs i could leave my house i could change states i could never talk to my family again like and society would totally support and affirm that and make that completely accessible to me that level of um liberation I think is ultimately it's ultimately toxic and makes it more difficult to engage with our finitude as a positive good. Um, th this is something that I'm this is something that I'm trying to work on is a, a a theory of freedom that doesn't take recourse to liberation because I think liberation is fundamentally a sort of this capitalist concept. Um, I think that it's looking to, it, it, it posits an older, it posits like a state of imprisonment that we then need to be liberated from. And I think the paradigm of, you know, positing a state of unfreedom in order to then, which you then have to remove these bars in order to be released into this new liberation, this new liberated state where you no longer have those things. That paradigm, I think one is, uh, designed to engender discontent it's designed to exacerbate desire it is designed to operate on the eye and envisionment and fantasy and it ultimately is designed to denigrate finitude and existence and the positive structures of the reality in which we find ourselves so this is something that i'm trying to engage with is understanding of freedom that is not a liberation because I think that this liberation concept, you know, you can maybe take Deleuze's territorialization and deterritorialization of how capitalist capitalism works. Like what is a freedom that is, it's not, it's not territorialization and it's not deterritorialization. Cause I like Deleuze's sort of total like deterritorialization is also a part of capitalism, which Nick Land points out. It's this, it's this oscillating movement of setting you free and capturing you. How do we get out of the, oscillation of territorialization and deterritorialization and posit a genuine freedom uh, that that was a lot but that's kind of something that i'm working on well good luck <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's 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 a big big project and yeah there there is a lot there is a lot there but i just want to sort of say that i totally agree that I don't think we're ever going to have a full transparent communion with the other. I don't think we're ever, I don't, I don't think, I think like the stakes, and I think this is reflected in the stakes of at least how I understand Hegel and Lacan is that the idea that you can just be fully naked and fully transparent and think that's the truth. I don't think like, I don't think that's the truth. The truth involves the appearances, right? Like the truth involves the covering up. 
right? Like there, there, there is, there is, a, there is a truth there, and and that makes the truth all the more complex and 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 difficult. But it's like you know, it's like it's like the person who just strips naked and screams in the middle of the city or something like that is like it's like you know the. There is that in us, you know, like that we want to like just strip naked and scream, you know, like, but that's somehow not, that's not the way to go, you know? And um, yeah. And I also like what you're saying about um, having infinite possibilities to like, for example, I'm going to leave my family and I'm going to go to the other side of the planet and get a job and change my entire identity. And 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 also like recognizing society would completely affirm that type of psych like legitimately kind of psychopathic behavior right it, it, that that also sort of gets us into a very toxic society and i feel like that is in some sense what a lot of perhaps men in particular but maybe men and women um are 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 finding attractive like like I'm thinking here about like passport bros, you know, like just get, you know, get, get a, get a passport and just go, you know, just go find a woman in Colombia or something like that. Or like, you know, just, just, just F off from wherever you currently are and just start a life somewhere else and, and reinvent your entire identity and, 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 and that type of thing. But to me, it all comes down to, again, if we're thinking about the desire of the other and the problem, of the desire of the other. What I want to come to is something that you think I think you hyper highlight in your in your in your paper, which is basically humans is the problem of self consciousness, and and coming down to the problem of self consciousness in terms of comparison and judgment of others, like comparison comparison with others, and judgment of others, where where and 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 like to me this is something that comes up a lot in my conversations with um with Thomas Hamelrick who's a Girardian is mimetic rivalry and he always emphasizes it in the context of hyper technological society that like what we don't like and basically this is like what like the like for example the mark zuckerbergs uh, the elon musk whatever the tech the tech guys underestimated or perhaps just didn't care about was that hyper connecting the world is super dangerous Right, because you're hyper connecting the world, and what you're not taking into consideration are the flows of desire. If in the Deleuzian sense, the you're just unleashing the flows of desire, and and then you have this problem of, like you're saying, uh, the hype. How can we be content? How can we be? How can we enjoy our freedom, in the sense that I can constantly compare myself with everyone on the planet, um, and judge everyone else on the on the planet. Right. So maybe just get your some of your thoughts on here. What what are you thinking on along this line? I like what you said of like how am I to enjoy my freedom? <laughs> uh because I do think because desire and enjoyment are distinguished in Lacan's theory. I think it's important to keep them apart. Like desire is going to be that the the game that's stacked against you. It's you're designed to lose desire. It's it's not a game that can ever be won. Whereas enjoyment is a game that can be won through failing to meet its own objective. And so I think that enjoyment is kind of the more properly uh, finitudinal structure. It's uh, yeah. It's so. Whereas. I, I do think, though, that the the possibility of both desire and of drive, enjoyment, are they just are present in human beings. I don't think that you're going to be able to get one without the other because of our kind of biological structure. And one thing that I really like about psychoanalysis is the way that it brings our psychological structure back to physical structure. It brings like back to kind of the contingencies of materiality of uh, this is what I'm writing about for the Hegel anthology. I'm writing about the fact that we have lateralized brains and how different parts of the brain evolved at different times and the way that uh, kind of the left and the right brain do have these tendencies to operate in slightly varied ways, but they need each other. And so the fact that we have these split brains that uh 
are that have different capabilities and different functions across them uh, that we have language sort of very late on this very late in the game evolutionarily and then of course lacan's whole great work on what happens when the infant emerges from the womb uh, you know you could think about the fourth trimester or even just kind of those early stages of development and the helplessness that comes from that leading to the mirror stage um i i think that human like human beings are wired to be this mess of interacting systems that are all kind of grinding together and are not fully optimal and that that's kind of where the experience of finitude comes from. It fundamentally comes from the inoptimality of multiple biological systems that ultimately were not exactly made for each other and then being penetrated by signs, you know, it's just there's and, and by images. And so I view human beings as just these uh, very tortured, inoptimal sort of creatures who nonetheless have this incredible capacity to to think, to enjoy, to remake the world, to create. I think that historically the Christian church has viewed the act of creating as a core part of what it means that the image of God is in human beings. Um, the, the image of God is actually like in the tradition is really more of this uh, capacity to act and to be rather than some artifact that's possessed. I think that kind of human rights discourse that needs to be kind of moved beyond and discarded ontologize the image of God into this thing that people possess. And it's kind of this material core object a perhaps that is um, that everyone possesses and you need to absolutely treat it as sacred. But I think that the, the tradition has more emphasized the capacity to create and to think and to engage and to love. And so the, the things that we can do that are kind of unique in the community of beings speaks to, uh, speak to, speaks to our, both the highest and the lowest in us, which, which I think is interesting, both that God would be the highest and the lowest. Uh, he makes himself the lowest in, on the cross. And yet also he's the highest thing. Um, this ability to contemplate the whole, to reflect and to to engage in love and freedom and uh, and in, in grace and forgiveness and reconciliation, these things that are just um, these things that are totally unique for human beings and that seem to define the things that are really beautiful in life. Yeah, I love the <clears throat> I love the way you're articulating that, and specifically the the coincidence between these opposites of the highest and the lowest with creation, it seems absolutely essential to think through. I also like the way you're emphasizing the human being as a, as a tortured creature. Um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about, is there, is there a connection there? Is there a connecting point or is there a fundamental distinction there between Zen Buddhism and Christianity in regards to, to thinking through these things? Does Zen Buddhism have the resources in your reading to think through creation in this sense? Or is is this just a, a fundamental difference between Christianity and Zen Buddhism? I don't know if you had further questions sort of near the end of the paper, but this is kind of where I start to go with the paper is that I do see a divergence here between Buddhism and Christianity in that I think that Christianity affirms the value of this fraughtness of our being. Whereas I see, I think Buddhism is kind of like this in more of a Wittgensteinian sense is kind of like, well, this is a problem. That's actually not a problem at all. We need to dissolve it, you know, and that you can dissolve this through um, a practice that alters consciousness. You know, basically consciousness is the problem. We can engage in practices that are able to ameliorate that problem so that we can be released back into the things themselves. Whereas I think Christianity basically says that door is barred. We're not animals. Basically, we have irrevocably passed into this new realm of humanity, which is defined by both this highest of divinity and this lowest of humanity, the tortured animal, the man, Job, in, in dust, cutting himself with a potsherd, is sort of 
is it an animal or is it a man? We don't know. And yet it is kind of, it coincides with this, with the height of, of humanity as well, this ability to resist with everything that you have. And so to me, I think Christianity takes that, like it both says that that door is barred. There's no going back. Human beings are these creatures. How do we move forward? How do we love this? How do we affirm this? How do we redeem this through this dialectical movement? Whereas I do think that Zen, even though you could say that, oh, it's not really a going back. Ultimately, I think it's an avoidance of the problem because the the question is not just like, it's not just, can you change consciousness? Like you'd have to change your materiality to be able to ultimate to, to quote unquote go back like this consciousness is not just something that um like it it is also dependent on the hardware the software and the hardware sort of co-developed together and so you're not just going to be able to rewire yourself with your software you would that would ultimately change you into a different creature fundamentally and so i don't think there's a way to go back because of the way that I think language is under theorized in Buddhism. I think that the materiality of consciousness's emergence is under theorized. Uh, and then I also, I, I do think that um, the relationship of desire and the other is under theorized because desire in Buddhism is fundamentally the problem that consciousness creates. Uh, basically that things arise, then they disappear. We feel this lack from something that disappeared. We feel this desire for it to return. We want to have something. We see something. And I think that that, to me, that's a too individualistic picture of how desire operates. So that would be kind of the big big things I would point out. Um, whereas I think Christianity wants to really engage with those. And it it doesn't turn away from it. I think that there are forms of it that do and kind of go into this, you know, you've got all kinds of you know rapture theologies and you've got kind of like oh christianity is just about saving you from your sins so you can go to heaven like i think that there's these very exoteric interpretations of the religion but i think if we're i i don't consider myself a hermeticist in any sense um but i think if you're going to go with kind of like a more esoteric interpretation of what christianity is i think it has to do more with this grappling uh grappling with finitude and trying to understand how um, how finitude also can include infinity, and how infinity also includes finitude, and kind of moving moving that forward with a positive symbol, like God on the cross and a and a resurrected human. These positive these positive symbols move that understanding forward rather than just kind of holding it in place. Beautifully said. And I think that specifically here, the under theorized dimensions of the Buddhism, I think you you identified them well. You know, language, uh, the emergence of materiality, and then desire of the other. So that's that's I think that's that's really something to to work with at this intersection, both I think with Buddhism and Christianity, Buddhism and psychoanalysis, maybe Buddhism Buddhism philosophy as well. So Thinking along these intersections, you know, is is I think there's a lot of fruit that can come from that. I guess sort of trying to steel man or you know create um, the strongest possible argument in sort of Zen Buddhism's favor, you know, we'd have to dive into a little bit in your paper what you talk about as Zen Buddhism aiming towards transcending to the plane of absolute nothingness and the the three steps by which uh, Zen Buddhism claims you can transcend to the plane of absolute nothingness. And what I would be interested to know is if you could explain a little bit about what that means, maybe what those three steps involve um, and how maybe in that context, it, it could be a, a regression, a desire to go back to something that's impossible or, 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 or not. Uh, yeah. Maybe just start there. Yeah, so I think that Buddhism in this structure of three steps where you basically, there is just kind of conscious existence where you take subjects and objects to kind of exist on this plane. 
once you realize the emptiness of that division, basically that 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 distinction can't be sustained logically, you realize the emptiness of of of, of subject object. But what you then have to do is there's still a third step where you realize the emptiness even of that emptiness. And so there's this threefold movement where you're both where you're going from kind of like you could say sort of just stupid being sort of just brute experience to kind of the understanding of subjectivity to then even emptying both objectivity and subjectivity. Um, what's interesting is I think Buddhism falls trap to the, at least in this, at least I get into this in the paper into believing that, believing like that truth has this return structure to it where you're getting back to like a lost, uh, like an original lost unity. Um, so I actually, I'm posting my piece about this tomorrow morning. It's called how to change the past. And I'm talking about the, I'm talking about retroactivity in knowledge and basically how through the addition of a new sign, you can retroactively change everything that came before. And Buddhism gets into this where they 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 have to posit the original unity of all things in order for you to progress through the stage to where you return to the original unity of all things. I talk about this in the paper. There's the it was the Hongaku controversy where they were trying to determine are are plants enlightened or not, which is totally a weird question. But what it's actually about is is everything already enlightened and we're the weird ones or is enlightenment something that has to be achieved? And where Zen kind of landed was plants are enlightened and humans are not. <laughs> Basically the everything is already perfectly settled in itself, perfectly empty of itself. And then human beings are the weird ones who think we're not. And the goal is to get back to that. And so it's interesting is they, they, they ended up positing that original unity and the goal of the progression is to get back to that unity so i think in hegelian terms we realize that the return that the original unity never existed it's it's an effect of the process um now to what extent could zen affirm that yes that original unity is an effect of the process i don't know um there does seem to be a sense that something is being recaptured or that you're going back to what is more real or more better. Um, it, it's hard for me to say because otherwise, like, why would you want to return to it um, if it's not better or if it's not sort of like, if it's not a surpassing of illusions. So th that's kind of the threefold stage, but the threefold stage in a very Hegelian sense is predicated on positing a prior lost unity that I think is illusory. Right. So there's, there's again, this, <clears throat> there is this, you know, there is this sense in which there's, 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 there's something of a, of a triadic or a dialectical movement in Zen, but Again, it's the, the the main distinction seems to be this this original nothingness, so this original this original unity um, versus sort of um, say a primordial division or a primordial cut that o that opens up a process and 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 maybe there's there's some distinction there that that needs to be thought through more deeply. Um, and this is something that Zizek brings up a lot about Buddhism. Is just that there's not an explanation of what did why did the problem of consciousness emerge in the first place? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I've I've actually reached out to some Buddhist scholars about this, and the answer I consistently get is there's not a good answer to this in the tradition. So I don't think that this is just Zizek pulling stuff out of his butt. Like it, right. it there really isn't this problem is under theorized in Buddhism itself of if everything is originally empty. Where did consciousness come from? How did this problem even arise in the first place? And I, yeah. to me, I would, I would push on that to try to understand that more, because I think that that kind of signals that there's something that needs work. Yeah, no, I've always been, con I mean, I've I've always been impressed and convinced by by Zizek's arguments uh, in regards to to Buddhism, and I I've always liked the way he he juxtaposes 
um, Buddhism and Christianity. I mean, I'm tempted here to ask you, maybe it can be connected in some sense to the concept of sunyata. Um, if, if you have any any view or any um, perspective on um, the notion of nirvana and where nirvana is theorized in Buddhism, uh, do, do you have any, have you thought about this? Have you, it doesn't come up in your paper, but yeah, is there is there a relevance here to asking about that? Yeah, I do think that there's something to be said about nirvana here because one way that Zen can differ from other traditions of Buddhism is the way that it theorizes nirvana, which is basically that nirvana is samsara. So samsara being the world of suffering, kind of the everyday plane of existence and that that we operate on, um, the the cycle of death and rebirth. Uh, where there's karmic action, basically things that you do create ripple effects that have effects either in this life or the next sort of down the road for other beings as well as yourself. So in fact, Zen basically re-theorizes nirvana as a way of being in samsara, of actually uh, nirvana is not an escape from samsara. It is a reorientation that takes place within samsara wherein one realizes that samsara is nirvana so that is a really fascinating kind of hegelian move yeah um, to me that resolves it i mean it, just in in terms of uh usually you'd see the dist like at, le at least in terms of the 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 buddhist temple i went to they would create a distinction between samsara and nirvana Yeah, and that's the thing in in the traditions. There's very much different. There's different ways of talking about it, and there, of course, there's exoteric ways and esoteric ways. So just because somebody talks about a distinction between nirvana and samsara doesn't actually mean they believe in that distinction. It could be a way of teaching that eventually could be a ladder you'd have to kick away, for instance. Um, so there's an esoteric core to most of the Buddhist traditions, uh, but you know, even like. The even like the Pure Land tradition, where the goal is to go to the Western Paradise to be with Amitabha Buddha in order to achieve enlightenment there. Um, even that, the ultimate goal is the falling away of that idea to realize that the Amitabha Buddha just is, is just your self authorization to achieve enlightenment. Um, so, uh, I think Zen is probably the most clear about this, though, that they really they they trying to demetaphysicalize everything and the goal is just that nirvana is a mode of inhabiting in samsara um I like however that. i think that the the way that they like every the what's missing is like the rest of it because what what it's what it seems to be missing is once you're reimmersed in this adventure like like what does that look like what do you do and I think that where Hegel is more helpful is uh, something Dimitri has pointed out a lot in his work is that like the return home is actually just the setting out on the journey again. Whereas for for Zen, it it's like the 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 end goal of practice is to always be practicing, uh, which is an interesting idea. But at the same time, it doesn't have the sort of movement where every attempt is incomplete which therefore catalyzes the next attempt it has the this circle like of circles yes exactly it's it's like it's too complete the process is yeah. too complete yeah yeah i love that i love that yeah it's 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 certain and, and we might might be able to make another connection there towards the end but I'm tempted. I'm tempted to bring it back to to specifically the dialogue between Heidegger and Nishitani, you know, towards the end of your paper and where you are now. What do you think is the impasse between the two, and what do you think the stakes are here? Is this really keeping your thought moving, or have you, in some sense, moved beyond their impasse? Yeah, I think that where I have continued to take that paper is in this dialogue between Christianity and Buddhism, because ultimately the way I saw those two figures, originally I just wanted to put them in dialogue to see where they had surprising resonances. But after a while, I realized that there was kind of um, 
I was unable to ultimately reconcile them, even though there were interesting resonances. And what I realized was it was because of the traditions that they were coming out of and the orientation they had towards the human. And I think that ultimately where it kind of runs aground is that Heidegger unconsciously is coming from this tradition where the human being is a problem, but not a problem with a resolution. Whereas for Zen, the human being is a problem and there is a solution. And I think that like that distinction kind of catalyzed a lot of my inquiry from that point on. And I, it led me into psychoanalysis where there is not necessarily a solution. There's just a continuation of the problem that there's like a, there's basically a new sign. You add a new sign to the sentence to transform the whole. And that sets you out again on the continual process of attempting, attempting, attempting. And we, enjoy the process of attempting along the way and that's actually the real that's the real value not the attempt to resolve into some fantastic obliteration for instance and so i think that it helped me see beyond the temptation to oblivion uh, that i think buddhism kind of holds out and led me back into the painful engagement with the other that I think Christianity holds at the heart of it. Um, it what, one thing that's so brutal about Christianity is it doesn't let you run away from the problem of the other. It, Jesus forces you again and again to have to engage. Like he says, if you have any issue with your brother and you find yourself at the altar, you need to leave your sacrifice and you need to go reconcile with your brother. And like things like that. And, and then St. Paul continues that in his letters. He's saying, let there be no discord between you. And it, have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus, that though he was in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, becoming lower than a servant. And so what like what's getting pushed is this, you have to engage with the other person you there's no sort of individual salvation and there's no way to just kind of retreat into this naturalistic pagan religion this monism where you can just sort of commune directly with god i think that in christianity god makes himself inextricable from the neighbor like the only place we encounter him is through the face of the neighbor um, that he makes himself uh, intimately connected with his creation in a way that we just, we can't get around it. The goal is not to get outside of or around creation to access God, but God's like, Hey, I'm over here. You're trying to find me over there, but I've already told you where I'm at. It's just really hard. And I know you don't want to try. Yeah. Well said. So do you, do you think in the end, like ultimately here to, you know, you've already said Heidegger's design kind of leaves this out of the picture. And and I, I would even say that I've seen Heideggerian scholars, you know, they they kind of they I would say they they tend away from Christianity, uh, from what I've seen, you know, and, and Heideggerian I mean Heidegger himself goes a little fascist, I mean comes Nazi, and you know, whether we want to read too much into that or or we want to discard of that, I do kind of sense that there's a fascistic tendency within within Heidegger and then and then Nishitani and and I think Zen Buddhism overall is is a political you know it, it doesn't have that political dimension it kind of goes to the monast tends towards the monastic life so you know in your playing with Heidegger and Nishitani and and are are you using th this this discourse are you using this antagonism to really sharpen your your Christian philosophy and politics Yes, I, I would say that that's the case. I very much, through my engagement with Buddhist philosophy, I definitely for a time kind of found myself trending more towards that direction, being like, well, there's a lot of value here. I really like this. I'm wondering, you know, what what is Christianity bringing to the table? But I think that it was through reading Zizek and psychoanalysis that helped me realize, oh, wait, Christianity is actually bringing something really unique to the table here that Buddhism isn't. And I actually think that's extremely valuable. I don't want to lose that. And so I do think that 
Heidegger does. Um, Heidegger does have this tendency to like, I kind of see him as coming out of a Christian tradition influenced subconsciously by Christianity, but in the way that kind of like current alternative right discourse is trending, he's kind of this like pagan return a little bit. He kind of wants to go back to paganism, like the old gods, whereas, and whereas Buddhism, I see as basically it'll align itself with whatever's most powerful. It, you know, if that's a fascist imperialism in Japan, it'll affirm that if it's a capitalist, um, you know, multicultural woke managerialism, it'll align itself with that. Whatever is the predominant ideology, it will slot itself into that because it doesn't have those resources for resistance. It's a pure practice of reconciling oneself with kind of just whatever is and, and dealing with that and enjoying the prize of the, of interiority. So both of those I see as a problem where I think Christianity can be uh, often is not, but it can be the the sand in the gears here. So I, I think that Christianity has those resources to be able to resist the machine and to allow us to genuinely develop a practice of love that is a, a social, that is inextricably social, and ultimately that is going to lead us into communion with with God, but not in a disembodied way not in a way that allows us to do an end run around creation, but only through a, a deepening of our engagement, both with our, with the world, with ourselves and with others in community. That's pressing into the problem is that that's the way forward. The only way forward is um, the only way out is forward. Uh, it turns out that the out is just more forward. So. Well, I, I totally see that in terms of, what you describe politically from from not so much it doesn't matter Heidegger or Nishitani, but what I see among Heideggerians and Zen Buddhists, like on the Heideggerian side, I, I do see a tendency to this pagan return. I, I do see a tendency to the old gods were the only gods we needed. Um you know, so there is that that you know, even even Heidegger's project of returning to to being with the big B, you know, as as a kind of failed failed project is kind of like to to me, Hegel's logic of being and nothing. I, I, to me, I'm satisfied with that logic. It, it, to me, I I can I can work with that logic as a process. So I'm not sure. You know, I'd have to I'd have to I'd have to study. I'd have to study Heidegger's project of re return to being to to clarify that more for myself. But in any case, I'm 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 satisfied with with that. And then on 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 the on the Buddhist angle, you know, aligning itself with whatever's most powerful. I often make jokes. I think it's easier for Starbucks to put an image of a meditating Buddha in their cafe than it is to put an image of a bleeding Christ on in the cafe. Right. So so it's it's easier for, I think, the Buddhist symbols, the yoga and even like, you know, the yoga mats and the yoga pants and the, and all, all that, you know, and, and at the same time, you know, I, I, I do personally have a huge issue with people who over identify as Christian, because sometimes I feel like when people over identify as Christian and use Christian language and, and terminology as uh, as currency, sometimes I feel like it misses the point and and, and sometimes it. It it, it it precisely doesn't become the sand in the gears, but precisely becomes the machine itself. So my question to you is like, where, what do you think are the mistakes? So, so people who are increasingly finding a return to Christianity as desirable and as politically necessary, what are the mistakes here that can be made? What do you think we should watch out for? What do you think could go wrong, um, and what would you personally sort of see as 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 problematic or or possibly dangerous? Oh boy, that's a whole can of worms. I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I will try to I will try to be uh, succinct. So one of the big things that I see a lot online is kind of this deconversion from Christianity to or. This deconversion from Protestantism to Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, and um, I, 
I apologize for what I just said. I do not think that those uh, I do not think that those groups are not Christian. I do believe that they're Christian. Um, but I, what I, I I'm concerned about this movement towards back towards Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, as um, because they have liturgy and because they have quote unquote enchantment and because they have tradition and these sort of things. I think that uh, I'm concerned that people are coming back to the church because they want a new master, you know, in the Lacanian terms, like you want a new master, well, you will have one, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of that. Like I'm personally, I'm not Roman Catholic for very principled reasons. And I love my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. They've done so many good things. Um, there's a lot of value there, but I'm, I, I think that ultimately people are, People are returning to tradition and liturgy because they want something stable in this crazy world. They want somebody to provide them the answers. They want something that they don't have to work on or build themselves. They want something that's kind of like off the shelf, really, because it's just there. The machine just turns and you can show up at mass and the prayer wheel just gets turned. And so you can do that. Um I personally would caution folks against that. I don't think that that's going to be, I don't think that's the answer people are really going to be satisfied with in the long run. At least if you're really trying to genuinely engage with these problems and take responsibility for your own actions and your own way of being in the world. Um, so that would be, that would be the big thing that I would caution folks against. But I also see, I see a lot of folks who've left the church because they have felt hurt because they felt abused um, the, talk about the Catholic Church, physical abuse, um, but also a lot of folks, especially from like young evangelicals, talking about spiritual abuse. Um, I can't speak to every single person; those things are incredibly personal. But my my personal counsel to people is also: don't go. Figure out how to make things better, and that doesn't mean stay where you are, where you're being hurt. But what it would be is the vision of community of human beings who are loving was never a vision of perfect people. And that doesn't make any abuse okay. But what it means is that wherever you go, there are human beings. And wherever you go, there you are as well. You're a part of the problem. They're a part of the problem. We're all the problem. And... um. Yeah, this is probably going to come across as really hollow to people with very personal stories. So I can't, I shouldn't go much further because I would rather talk with those individuals. But my my request is stay because Jesus stays. <laughs> Jesus is working. And I personally think that the we're not allowed to run away from the problem of being together with other people and figuring out what that brutal community looks like, of what it takes to figure out how to be together and to belong together. Um, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be painful. I don't think we can run away from the problem, uh, but it also doesn't mean that you need to stay and endure abuse. So that's the difficult thing that needs to be worked on. Well, geez, that's, that's, that's the zero level, isn't it? Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's, 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 that's really, that's really nailing the problem. And let me just say that I'm, I'm not just a little bit, I'm, completely aligned with the way you're articulating the relationship between Protestantism, Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy. And I see what you see. And and I'm also concerned about it. Um for me personally, you know, I I I you know I don't have a Christian upbringing. You know, I, I was raised secular. Um you know and 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 really my entrance into this is is kind of backwards. You know, um, because I'm I'm coming from a let's say just a scientific atheist background, um, and then coming into philosophy. But but I, I do I did actually study the history of Christianity, and I found the historical breaks leading to Protestantism to be quite revolutionary and important. Um, so. I think that's maybe enough that I need to say on that right now, but I, I really do see what you see in regards to this denominational fracturing. Um, 
and maybe also just relating a little bit personally to what you're saying about just stay is and also the contradiction of just staying is is you know i do think we should commit to a vision of community where we're dealing with imperfect people and we're all part of the problem and then it, it's hard to find the line where where it's really hard to deal with with the issue of forgiveness and 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 the ethics of when someone really does do something that's that's that seems beyond the pale um and how to deal and and those are just so per like you said i mean you said it right so personal irreducibly singular and i think our task is to you know be willing to confront that with all the pain involved and 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 knowing that there's not one big solution not one master like you said there's not one master not one big other that's going to solve all of these irreducible particular singular pains which people involve in being with community and with the other but maybe on a final question for you is this talk was about your paper inspired by Heidegger and Nishitani, and then we come to Christianity, and we come to the desire of the other, and we come to the pains of community, and we come to, do we really find the resources in Heidegger and Nishitani for these issues? Is, you know, what would you say to the people on the Heideggerian side and the, the Buddhist side about about your process and 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 your relationship to these traditions now and just as a sort of maybe final final closing note yeah i think for me the the group that you didn't mention there that i actually really hope the piece could speak to would be people who um are don't find themselves in either camp uh in fact as a, as a young man growing up i was a part of, you know, like I mentioned, a tiny Protestant domination. They had a very particular way of viewing knowledge and philosophy. And it was it was overwhelmingly negative. It was um for for people who know, it was um Van Til and presuppositionalism. Um it was this it's this approach to knowledge that's very much like um well you need the Holy Spirit to be able to understand the world and non-Christians don't have it. Therefore um, they don't really have real knowledge and we can just kind of deconstruct their ideas. And so um, it was this, ironically, it was very arrogant and it was very nihilistic. I, I, you know, kind of both of these things came together. And as I went into college, I started to understand like really the first opening for philosophy for me was, oh, my mind is involved in knowledge. That knowledge is actually just, it is an operation of a singular located creature. And so for me, that was the beginning of my quote unquote, radicalization, I guess you could say. Um, so I would hope, you know, one one group of people I hope this paper could speak to would people who haven't really even taken the Kantian turn yet, who haven't even made the transcendental move yet to realize that maybe knowledge is a process of a finite creature. And that therefore it's not about the acquisition of truths as objects. It's not about the final consummation of um, sort of a fully transparent whole or of a correspondence between kind of the shape of the mind and the shape of reality. That maybe these are obfuscations of the real problem that we're trying to engage with. So that would be my first thought that really that was for me the you know when i first when i first read alistair mcintyre and then i read Gautamer's truth and method and then i read being in time this movement of realizing that we're embedded creatures who have these basic structures of finitude that are the possibility of knowledge that was the big opening for me and then when i got into studying zen and comparing it to heidegger i think that i began to become more open to the way that uh, thought needs a mechanism for breaking itself up. It needs a mechanism for its own humility and understanding its own emptiness. And so to me, I think that's one of the great things that 
Buddhism brings to the to the Western tradition, which has a tendency towards, you know, Hegel as the caricature of wanting absolute full knowledge, I think speaks to a caricature about Western philosophy that is accurate. And I think that one thing that Zen can bring uh, is this deconstructive move of having knowledge be humbled, realize its own limitations, realizing its own contextual operation, and realizing that the goal is not just to think, but it's actually to return to the things themselves. Um, but the things themselves, that's not just this naked return to objects that exist as they are, exactly how they are um, in separation from us. But even this separation is itself a part of the illusion that knowledge feeds. So I'm trying to see how, how do different traditions of thought how are they incomplete within themselves, but serve a useful function for us as we engage in the task of thinking? Very well said. So hopefully all you pre-Kantians out there were listening and uh, Matthew Stanley's Samsara Diagnostics is available for you with the links in the description. And I'll also say uh, that his text, It Was Nothing, I'll, I'll also link that in the description. So it's fantastic having a chance to have an extended dialogue with you, Matthew. Thanks to everything that you've brought to the philosophy portal community over this last year um, and all of your work at Samsara Diagnostics. Do you have any final thought you want to leave the viewers with before we sign off? I just want to thank you, Cadell, for kind of pulling together the philosophy portal community and I've definitely gotten to know Hegel better from engaging with um, the conference through the uh, published works, through talking with other people. And so you've just got a diverse group of people here that are really in, in a conversation that I think is important, that I think is valuable. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to be a part of it as well as the Lacan course, which I'm working on catching up on. <laughs> slowly um, but thoroughly enjoying so yeah thank you for the opportunity to speak to your listeners to speak with you and i am i'm just thankful to wake up and start the day this way all right that's been matthew stanley samsara diagnostics it was nothing and we're out for courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today.